Hello everyone and welcome back to our chapter 26 lecture number one mini series here. We are moving on to the second part, which is still basically an introduction to the urinary system. So we're not getting into in-depth material yet, but we're on our way there. You're definitely gonna wanna start understanding the structure of the nephron, which we can see over here. Uh, and we're gonna be breaking that down to understand how exchange happens, but really, the bulk of the detailed exchange is gonna come when we get to lecture number two. So you have a little bit of time here, um, but the reality is you should be getting very, very comfortable with uh, this anatomy here of the kidney, and you're gonna wanna get comfortable with the anatomy of the nephron and understand some of the basics. So that's what we can see here. We're gonna talk about two types of nephrons, and we're gonna talk about some of the processes involved in your urine, urine formation, but most of which we've seen quite a bit of those processes, so some of it should be uh, kind of a review. All right, but uh, let's get into the last part before we move on to lecture number two. So this is part two of lecture one here. Uh, as usual, we are still following along in Pearson's uh, Anatomy and Physiology, um, so make sure you follow along in that book there. All right, let's get into this. The functional unit of the kidney. Now, when we first started off, we said the kidney lobe was the functional unit of the kidney. Now that's at a macroscopic perspective. Usually that means we're gonna be able to break that down, but we know all the main functional units are found within that individual structure. Now what we're talking about here when we go into the functional unit, we're talking about the final unit that actually does everything. So this is the microscopic, the real main functional unit. If you're gonna be the most specific you can, the most specific functional unit is gonna hands down be the nephron. And that's usually what I would ask. So don't think kidney lobe is always the functional unit. It's the, the macroscopic functional unit because that's where everything is. But really nephrons are all confined into a lobe. And so it's really the, the nephron that's gonna carry out all of the specific functions. So when we start, start talking functionality, literally every one of these parts that you see here, you can see they're talking renal corpuscle, they're talking the proximal convoluted tubule, the distal, we have a nephron loop to consider that's composed of a uh, descending thin limb, a thick ascending limb. So we're gonna break all those things down. So let's start with the renal corpuscle here. And so that's this structure right here. So you know that it's the renal corpuscle. And that renal corpuscle is going to involve several components, as we can see. It's got an outer glomerular capsule. So this is called the glomerular capsule. And this glomerular capsule, as you can see, surrounds a knot of capillaries that are known as the glomerulus. So inside, we have a knot of capillaries called the glomerulus. You definitely need to know the difference between those two structures, even though the when we talk about the actual renal corpuscle, it consists of both the glomerular capsule and glomerulus. I label up both, all the structures here. So I would easily be able to lay, uh, label up this outer layer by literally putting a sticker on a model that I have that looks like this and say, what's this outer layer known as? So you really have to break this down and understand all of the details related to it. Okay, so renal corpuscle has a glomerular capsule that surrounds the glomerulus. So next we have to consider how blood reaches this glomerulus. And if we just look on there, we got the terms afferent and efferent. And notice we got the terms arterial, which we're very, very familiar with. So blood is gonna arrive to the glomerulus by, uh, by the afferent arterial, okay? And so afferent, we know we've seen this term before. We've seen it with the nervous system, right? The uh, afferent neurons, the efferent neurons, et cetera. Um, but when we talk about this, the afferent arterial that's delivering blood to the glomerulus, and again, when the glomerulus, you need to know it's a cluster of intertwined uh, capillaries, and it's approximately 50. So this is not doing it justice on how complex that glomerulus is. But notice the main point is we're going to have tons and tons of surface in area in here that's going to promote filtration, which is going to be represented by this green arrow. And we're going to be talking about that. So notice site of filtration. And that is a key point for the glomerulus. It's the only site along the nephron that is gonna have filtration occur. So you might wanna circle and really make sure you get, this is the location where filtration is going to occur. At that same time, if we have blood that reaches this area, we have to have blood that leaves that area as well. And so this blood is going to leave via the efferent arterial. So efferent is going away or exiting. That's usually the way I like to think of it, but that's what you should be aware of there. All right, and so all of this is gonna flow after it leaves the efferent arterioles. This is gonna flow into a network of capillaries that end up surrounding these uh, areas down here. So they surround what's called renal tubules. That's this area here. 
All right, and those are going to be called paratubular capillaries. So paratubular capillaries is where a lot of exchange between these tubes are going to occur. It's going to occur between the paratubular capillaries and the nephron itself there. And so we'll be talking about that. You'll get familiar with this, but you definitely need to know paratubular capillaries come after the efferent arterial. Uh, just as the numbers say, there are approximately 1.25 million nephrons in each kidney. So you definitely know this kidney is quite an energy expensive organ. It's doing a lot to filter and clean the blood. If you ever know anyone on dialysis or any uh, ever heard, um, dialysis is pretty challenging to deal with. You've got to go in, you're sitting in a chair for really long times, and you're going in for about uh, three times to four times a week. Um, so, you know, kidneys are extremely important for purifying and cleaning our blood and making sure and, and communicating basically with the liver that these things are right. And that's ultimately what ends up going on is we need to purify the blood. And you can just see that pure nephron number is really uh, supporting the importance of the kidney, right? And so in this lecture, we're really dealing with it with blood flow. And so, you know, I like blood flow questions. And so certainly a concept like this is something you should spend some time on. And so renal arteries are going to enter the kidney. And so we see that there and you can see the renal veins are exiting. And what's that site? <clears throat> That's an entrance and exit site for arteries, vessels, and in this case, ureters. We've seen this name plenty of times. So hopefully you're able to recall the term hilum and that's going to be the site where blood vessels enter and uh, leave, as well as where the ureter exits. So being able to recognize this structure, definitely one that uh, I like students to be able to recognize and know. We've seen it with the lung. We've seen it with now the kidney. We've seen it with the lymph node. So it's a very common term in anatomy, right? So something you, hands down, should be able to recognize. Now, notice the kidney receives about 20 to 25% of cardiac output. Notice 1.2 liters of blood per minute. Um, so a lot of a lot of work is going on by these kidneys as I continue to stress over and over and over again. All right, so the order of flow, this is something you hands down should be able to recognize, should be able to list on an exam. We start off at the renal artery, and then as you can see, the renal artery branches, and it becomes segmental arteries once it starts to branch. So if we're in this region down here, these are segmental as long as it's not this thick one. So as soon as we get small ones, we're in the segmental artery. And then that seg segmental artery, artery will branch in between the lobes. So if you look right here, this each of these represent a lobe, right? So the renal pyramid and kind of the renal columns, which is in between, plus the cortical area, that's all a kidney lobe. Like I was stressing, it's kind of the larger functional unit. Actually, they highlighted it right here. That's the whole kidney lobe. And that's why it's called, the, one. it's the larger functional unit. But as we zoom in, if you notice, there's a whole bunch of renal corpuscles up here. So that's what we're looking at. And so we're going to eventually get there. So notice after segmental, we go between the lobes. And so that's the interlobar arteries, which are in here. And there's going to be interlobar veins as well. And then as you round to the top, so this top region here, that gets us to the arcuate artery and the arcuate vein. And you should be able to recognize those. And then those go into the cortex. And so they call them the corti cortical radiate arteries. That's going up here. And eventually these little branches off to the side become the afferent arterioles there. And then inside these little balls there, those balls at the top are, of course, representing, uh, they would be representing the renal corpuscles. Here they've broken off the renal corpuscles. And so here that's supposed to be the knot of capillaries. But on uh, the models that I have in the classroom, these hands down are covered and they're encapsulated. So that would be the renal corpuscle for the models that we have in the classroom. But clearly, the red is supposed to represent still um, the blood uh, vessel itself. So that is the glomerulus. All right, but after the glomerulus, then we, of course, go through the efferent. And you can see this down here, efferent arterioles to the paratubular capillaries. Then that's the paratubular capillaries. So all these structures here, that's where we're going to have things like the proximal and distal convoluted tubule. They're going to be nearby the structure. So they tend to be in the cortex region. And that's where we're going to see paratubular capillaries primarily surrounding those. Uh, they're going to be surrounding the nephron itself at the distal and proximal convoluted tubules mostly. So we're going to see that. But eventually when the paratubulars, after all the exchange, it becomes venules. And then we kind of do the reverse order. So notice arcuate vein. Well, technically cortical radiate vein going down. Then arcuate vein. Then in here we're between the lobes, so interlobar vein. And notice they don't actually have a segmental vein, which is kind of unique, but that's quite all right.
And so again, the remaining bullet points are just going to stress. Blood leaves the glomerulus at the efferent arterioles. And then that moves on to, again, continuing with capillaries, paratubular capillaries. So arterioles often become capillaries. And then we go to venules. So it's kind of unique because we go afferent arterial to glomerulus, which is a set of capillaries, through the efferent arterial back to another set of capillaries. So the exchange process is happening at the glomerulus and then paratubular capillaries there, which is going to be, again, the final area of adjustments, are going to be exchanged between paratubular capillaries and the remainder of the nephron. So we're going to find out that the glomerulus and the renal corpuscle is going to be the site where most of the main functions occur. But regardless of that, we're going to end up seeing that there's going to be continuous exchange going along the, the paratubular capillaries and the rest of the nephron. But hands down, we're going to break down this glomerulus in a lot of detail. We're going to break down the entire renal corpuscle in a lot of detail. All right, so when it comes to the nephron function, really the, the main point is it's going to help adjust blood pressure, blood volume, and solute concentrations as we're going to see as we move along here. Um, but that's going to be more for the second lecture, so we're not going to get into too many details quite yet. All right, and so where does urine formation begin at? Hopefully you note that the urine formation begins because we just started talking about this. But it's going to start right in that structure there at the renal corpuscle, or the glomerulus would be an acceptable answer as well because that's part of the renal corpuscle. So if you don't see renal corpuscle as an answer choice on a multiple choice exam, then you're probably going to be looking for glomerulus because that's where filtration starts technically. So either answer would be acceptable. It's not going to, you wouldn't see something like the renal capsule uh, or the glomerular capsule, I mean. You would just see glomerulus or as an answer choice or renal corpuscle. All right, but what happens is the filtrate, once it forms, because again, filtration occurs at the renal corpuscle or the glomerulus, you should know that once that happens, it's going to move through the renal tubules. And so that's what we're talking about here. These are the renal tubules. You can see they're even pointing renal tubule. All right, technically how it ends in tubule, that's what they're calling the uh, renal tubules. And so that's where absorption and secretion are going to occur. And then the flow of urine, as we're going to see, is going to go proximal convoluted tubule, PCT, to the distal thin limb to the ascending thin limb, to the thick ascending limb. So that's what TAL is. So you might want to put that thick ascending limb. And all those limbs make up the nephron loop. So you can see this nephron loop. So just to be clear, yes, you do need to know this categorization and understand it. All right. And then eventually that drains uh, to the distal convoluted tubule, which is distal from here, all of which will drain into the collecting system or the collecting duct. So get familiar with this anatomy. And you can see... Notice we start simple squamous in the renal cells, so the renal uh, capsule and the glomerulus. Those are all going to be squamous cells. The PCT, notice it's going to be simple cuboidal. DCT, simple cuboidal. And then these thin limbs you can see are simple squamous again. So definitely going to want to know those and be familiar, uh, get a little bit familiar with each of those steps. Um, but I'll be stressing that along the way. Now, a lot of what I've talked about, of course, was related to those paratubular capillaries. We haven't seen really an image of those. But uh, this is what the paratubular capillaries would look like. So notice we have the afferent arterial. We go into the glomerulus right there. We come out, notice this extensive network. So the capillaries, when we talk about uh, the paratubular capillaries, they are covering a huge portion of the tubular network. So you got to keep that in mind because this is where all the exchange is going to be happening. It's going to be between these tubes and between these capillaries here. All right, and so understand that each nephron is going to end up emptying into the collecting ducts. The collecting ducts are considered separate from a nephron. They're not part of the nephron because they're its own thing. Several nephrons join into a collecting duct here, and that's where they take the fluids away. So you're going to need to know collecting duct is not part of the nephron. Understand it's its own separate structure um, because it collects from multiple nephrons coming together, so they don't consider it part of the nephron since multiple nephrons join to it. All right, so definitely note the differences there. So this now takes us to the two types of nephrons, and this is going to close out kind of the introduction to the nephron. Again, lecture number two spends most of the time breaking down each individual segment, starting at the renal uh, corpuscle, working throughout the entire thing. Now, I think this does a great job showing you how, these, uh, how the paratubular capillaries work. We can see the tubular network, and we're able to even get into the nephron loop when it comes to something called the cortical nephron. So let's look at these two types of nephrons. All right, so cortical nephrons, where would they reside based on their name, right? Anatomy does a great job with 
terminology lining up with the uh, locations, right? And so here, cortical, what's that apply? Of course, that's applying the cortex, all right? And so what that's saying is these nephron loops are going to be more towards the cortical region, and we see that here, okay? You need to know this. You need to focus on this area. Um, on lab exams, again, I have lots of models similar to this, and the models, models have two nephrons. They have one that has a short loop and one that has a long loop, and I often will encase the entire nephron and ask, what is that structure? And it's specifically a cortical nephron because its loop is short and it resides mostly in the cortical region. So you need to know this. But fortunately, what you should pay attention to is cortical nephrons make up the vast majority of them. Okay, And so notice the efferent arterial, it's going to deliver blood to a specific set of capillaries known as the paratubular capillaries, and they're going to surround the entire renal tubule, all of it, including the loop. Okay, So that's the main point. Definitely should note this. Now again, 85% of all nephrons are cortical nephrons, so most reabsorption and secretion is going to occur due to cortical nephrons. All right, and the reason I'm stressing this is we're going to mostly utilize these throughout most of the day. They're the most important ones. Um, but what we're going to see is these are specialized. So you do need to know that, notice this is paratubular network. All right, so the paratubular network exists here. But notice we have something called the vasa recta, which is a little bit different. So juxtamedullary nephrons, these are the ones that go really deep into the medulla. These are going to be found in extended deep into the medulla. So juxtamedullary, extend deep into the medullary region. So notice the renal corpuscle starts in the cortex, but eventually that loop really descends down very, very deep. And so that's the main point. And then notice the paratubular capillaries, instead of them surrounding the entire uh, network of the nephron, they're going to actually surround just the uh, tubular region. So notice surrounding just the uh, PCT and the DCT or the tubules. And they're not getting to the loop. So you should be able to recognize the vasa recta makes the juxtamedullary nephrons unique. And that vasa recta is these capillaries that surround the very, very deep nephron loop. So make sure you know these two nephrons. It's very easy points to get correct. It's really easy testing material for me to generate good questions off of because we're comparing one versus another. So make sure you get these down and understand them. Cortical are the most common. They do most of the urine formation. But the main point is they have paratubular capillaries with short nephrons. All right, juxtamedullary, these are specialized. And the reason this is so special, as we get deep into the medulla, what we're going to learn is the salt concentration builds up in here. And so the function of these juxtamedullary nephrons, even though they only make up 15% of all nephrons, notice this is going to help us form concentrated urine. So when we really need something like ADH to help conserve water, well, this is the one where we're going to be having that ability to form concentrated urine, meaning full of solutes, not full of water. So a lot of water reabsorption would happen due to these types of nephrons. So water conservation helps. Uh, these juxtamedullary nephrons help with water conservation. All right, so that's going to wrap up the discussion on nephrons and kind of an intro to it. We got one last introduction to do. We're going to talk about the three processes that occur at the renal corpuscle. So let's get into these three processes, and this will wrap up this uh, second lecture, uh, or sorry, part two of the lecture and we'll be moving on to lecture number two following this. So this is part two of lecture one that we're wrapping up here. All right, but the main point here, when we talked about the renal corpuscle, okay, what was what process did I say happened here? And I was stressing it. You need to know the process of blank occurs specifically at the renal corpuscle or at the glomerulus. And hopefully you remember that process that I was talking about is going to be, of course, filtration. And so filtration, we've seen this already. We've talked about it with capillary exchange, and we are dealing with the glomerulus, which is capillary. So we're dealing with similar processes. But remember, filtration is one blood pressure created by that hydrostatic pressure, or I should say hydrostatic pressure, which is created by blood pressure, is going to force water and solutes of, again, in this case, it's going to be out of the glomerular cap, uh, capillaries into something called the capsular space. So the space between the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule is the capsular space. So this region right here, this region down here, that's where your urine formation is going to start. So notice this forms a filtrate within the renal corpuscle, and that's going to move on into the nephron. Well, the nephron tubules, I should say, because all the whole thing is the nephron, right? All right, so during this filtrate, just like we saw at the capillaries for regular exchange, Small solutes are going to pass the membrane. Large ones like albumins and things like that won't. Cells won't. 
but it's similar to the filtering of dissolved substances of like coffee grounds. So we use a filter paper and of course that pulls out substances out of the grounds, um, but we leave the big large grounds behind yet we still end up with a liquid that's full of those solutes. And so that's what this basically is doing. All right. Um, when we talk about this, this uh, we're going to learn that it's kind of like cleaning a fridge where your kidneys are kind of doing the same process. They're going to remove a whole bunch of stuff out of your blood, clean it all up, and then add the good stuff back. We're going to see that happen here. All right, we've seen this too, reabsorption, right? Solutes in water out of the filtrate, and then, of course, that's... So the filtrate is what we just produced through filtration. So reabsorption is bringing those solutes back inward. And if you remember... We're going to be moving on to this part. So this is where reabsorption and secretion are going to occur. So filtration only occurs here. Reabsorption is going to occur along the tubules. So notice the tubules are where we're going to have this. Um, it's along the entire remaining tubular network. So reabsorption and secretion are going to be specific at these regions here. All right, so no reabsorption. It's a highly noticed selective process. So a lot of that's going to be coordinated with uh, hormones. Hormones are going to help like calcitriol, PTH, calcitonin for calcium regulation. Remember, um, specifically PTH and um, calcitonin are going to target the kidney tubules. We're going to see that later. All right, notice often involves simple diffusion or use of carrier proteins. So again, uh, hormones that target this region will cause the epithelium to put in transport proteins to move those specific ingredients. We're going to see a little bit of that, again, in lecture two when we start getting into what events occur where. All right, but the reabsorbed substances tend to be neutral, uh, nutrients and useful substances. So like I said, we pull out, uh, the kidney's going to pull out all of the good stuff. So uh, during filtration, we're going to remove about 99% of all, uh, all of our good stuff, and then we're going to reabsorb all that right back. So keep that in mind. We're going to see this later. We get rid of we remove stuff just to reabsorb it. So reabsorption is going to happen quite a bit. All right, overall, water reabsorption is a passive process. So all the stuff that water moves is going to be by osmosis. But hopefully you're starting to understand these gradients and all these uh, the sodiums and salts and ions. Wherever those go, water is going to follow because that, of course, creates an osmotic gradient. So we'll just keep it in mind, water always moves by osmosis. That doesn't really change here. All right, but let's wrap up with the last process here. And that last process will close out um, this section here. So the three basic processes that we're going to see is finally wrapping up with the third, which is secretion. So we have filtration to start. We'll have some or most reabsorption occurring here and some secretion. And then when we get down to the distal, notice mostly secretion. Notice proximal convoluted tubule. They're uh, specifying mostly reabsorption of water. Now, there is some secretion, and that's a small amount that you see here. So secretion is coming back into the tubes. So when things leave tubes, assume that that is um, reabsorption. When things are going into the tubes, that's going to be secretion. And notice, proximal convoluted tubule, they start with reabsorption. Notice distal, they start with secretion. We're going to see that those are the main sites. So literally, you have filtration here. You have most reabsorption here. You have most secretion happening here. Again, that's not to say filtration, uh, or that's not to say that secretion doesn't happen here. It does. And that's not to say reabsorption doesn't happen here. It does. But most of this is going to be under the influence of hormones, as we're going to see a little bit later. So the final process to note is secretion, which is the movement of sol solutes and fluids uh, out of the body. And so they're going to move it out of the paratubular fluid, and then they're going to move it into the actual tubular fluid itself, the filtrate. So they're going to move it out of the paratubular fluid, which is what surrounds the tubes. And now this is where things get a little bit complicated. Um, so we got two types of fluid. We have paratubular fluid, which is surrounding this area. That's the interstitial fluid between the nephron tubes and the paratubular capillaries. So that's what paratubular fluid is. To be clear, for me on an exam, I usually use this term minorly, but I don't expect students to like, select it as an answer choice. But understand there's the paratubular capillaries are surrounding it. So when we talk about moving from paratubular fluid, we're saying it's moving from the fluid in back into the filtrate. So that's what secretion is. So if you want to simplify this, basically make sure you put it's the backup system for waste or undesirable material to be removed. So this is removal. When you hear secretion, it's going back into the urine. So secretion is movement out of the body and into urine. That's what I would put off to the side, out of the body and into urine. That's what secretion is. If you have that main point, that's the most important thing to understand about secretion. 
often this is how we get rid of like drugs and things like that that are in our system or toxins. So toxins, uh, detox of drugs, that's all going to be secretion. All right, so reabsorption and secretion, they're going to occur almost everywhere along the renal tubules, so everywhere over here. All right, and that exchange is going to occur by diffusion, osmosis, channel-mediated or carrier-mediated transport. That's just basically using proteins. That's what this is saying. So we'll talk about this in much more details, but the main point is filtration is singly occurring here. We're going to see most reabsorption is going to be at the PCT. Most secretion is going to be at the DCT. So PCT for reabsorption or proximal convoluted tubule at, for reabsorption, distal convoluted tubule for secretion. All right, but overall, that gives you a great basic introduction to the nephron and kind of the processes that we're going to deal with. As we move into the second lecture, the second lecture is just going to start off with describing the renal corpuscle and all of its functions, which is going to take up the first part of the lecture. And then the second part of lecture two is going to just continue right along. We move into the proximal convoluted tubule. We move into the uh, nephron loop and talk about countercurrent exchange. And then when we move into lecture number three, we wrap up the nephron. So... This is what our focus is going to be. It's This requires constant repetition. It's it's a unique sort of chapter. Um, there's a lot of processes that go on, but I think it's a pretty fair chapter, and you can do quite well if you stay on top of this material. So we're only through the first lecture. Make sure you stay on top of it. You need to finish the semester strong on a high note so you get that grade that you've been working for this entire time. All right. Thank you all for listening. As usual, I'll see you at the next lecture. Take care and have a great rest of your day.